नमस्कार व्यूअर्स हेलो एंड वेलकम टू सनसेट टीवी आई एम टीना झा योर वाचिंग पर्सपेक्टिव द सेकंड इंडिया जापान 2+2 मिनिस्टीरियल डायलॉग टू प्लेस ऑन थर्सडे इन टोक्यो डिफेंस मिनिस्टर राजनाथ सिंह एंड एक्सटर्नल अफेयर्स मिनिस्टर डॉक्टर एस जयशंकर अलोंग विद जापान्स मिनिस्टर ऑफ डिफेंस यासुकाजु हमादा एंड मिनिस्टर ऑफ फॉरेन अफेयर्स योशिमासा हयाशी रिव्यूड द बायलैटरल कोऑपरेशन अक्रॉस डोमेन्स एंड डिस्कस द वे फॉरवर्ड टू फर्दर एनहांस द इंडो जापान रिलेशनशिप India and Japan are currently pursuing a special strategic and global partnership. In addition to the 2 plus 2 format dialogue, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh also held bilateral talks with his Japanese counterpart Yasukazu Hamada. The two ministers acknowledge the importance of India-Japan defence partnership and the critical role it will play in ensuring a free, open and rules-based Indo-Pacific region while reaffirming that they would continue to vigorously promote defence cooperation and exchanges. for further enhancing Japan India special strategic and global partnership the key takeaways from the second india japan 2+2 ministerial dialogue the important agreements in the area of defense cooperation also issues of mutual and regional interests and security challenges all this and much more on the india japan relations with an esteemed panel of guests who are joining us virtually please to welcome on the program former ambassador dr shreel kan sharma professor rajaram panda senior fellow nehru memorial museum and library in new delhi and major general sanjay mestan retired he's a strategic analyst thank you gentlemen for joining us on this edition of perspective today to discuss the larger ambit of the india japan relationship and how critical is the second india japan 2+2 ministerial dialogue ambassador allow me to begin the program today with you let's first uh, you know try and understand what really has been the key focus of the second round of the 2+2 uh, uh, ministerial dialogue between india and japan and what have been some of the important regional and global issues that you think have been discussed uh, between uh, ministers of both sides you know this this meeting is uh, the second meeting of the 2 plus 2 and they have uh, reaffirmed and, and strengthened uh, the shared vision of the two countries uh, of the indo pacific as a free open and uh, uh, law based uh, region and uh, for the security like our india's sagar uh, prime minister sagar initiative which is security and for uh, and growth for all and uh, the late uh, japanese prime minister abe's uh, initiative of uh, asia pacific with security stability and prosperity these visions have so much of confluence and the uh, the meeting actually has followed up on this the areas of cooperation which have been identified have been uh, uh you know very wide they they talk about uh, uh you know the supply chain resilience for instance uh, and what has been agreed under the quad there are critical uh, areas like uh, new materials strategic uh, uh, minerals uh, and uh, the 5g initiative the digitization then in the area of defense cooperation uh, the meeting as you mentioned between uh, our defense minister Uh, Rajnath Singh ji and uh, his counterpart has really been very uh, forward looking they have uh, emphasized the importance of uh, defense cooperation with the two countries and coming uh, together and the critical role that this can play in the, for, for indo pacific peace and security and keeping the area free and law based and open uh, then uh, there is this uh, you know this is this framework is unique it is uh, 2 plus 2 we've had it with japan with australia with us and japan and all four are members of quad so this is a way of how the quad uh, arrangement is uh, giving given a further shape uh, in terms of uh, bilateral and multilateral strength then japan and india also are important members of the larger forums like india is going to lead the g20 next year and japan is also going to be uh, hosting the g7 so the, there there is a lot of overlap between our uh, responsibilities then india and japan are also part of the g4 group which is the group of four countries in the united nations uh, for for the last uh, several decades and they have been uh, you know the insistence has been on reform of the un and a meeting of g4 will be taking place next month in new, uh, in new york so this shows the sweep of uh, uh, the relationship between the two countries and the uh, integrate the, the nitigity of the discussions today uh, in 2 plus 2 shows the intensity and the depth of cooperation 
Absolutely. The uh, Japanese, uh, you know, vision uh, has come out of the old. They are self-confident, self-reliant, and uh, they are now no longer fettered by the past post-Cold War things. They are now looking at uh, a strong defense, uh, and, and, and they're looking at security alliances and partnerships with important countries. So Japan is uh, for diplomatic, uh, uh, you know, coordination. And uh, the countries which are important for, it, uh, for Japan are, apart from the US, India, Australia, and even Philippines in the, in the Asia Pacific. Both of them also place emphasis on ASEAN being central. Uh, they, they, we share the perspective about ASEAN. So then uh, the, the, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework cooperation framework, there also we are members, and that has been set into motion. That entails a, a, a whole uh, uh, agenda of cooperation between the two countries. Absolutely. So then, uh, uh, as, uh, a, a the, wide, the, wide range of issues, Ambassador, that you have cited in uh, uh, I, I'll take the, uh, the aspect of the defense cooperation to uh, uh, General Meston in just a while. But before that, uh, uh, Professor Panda, a quick word from you on, you know, this unique framework that India and Japan have had and how it, uh, it's only the second uh, 2 plus 2 ministerial that has taken place. But since 2019, a lot of it has changed globally as well as regionally. So in terms of geopolitics, the kind of, uh, you know, scenario that has changed today, how uh, uh, in the face of an assertive China over territorial disputes, it's a shared concern between India and China. So all of that impacting uh, the relationship, how do you think that has led to India and Japan evolving their relationship since the first uh, 2 plus 2 in 2019 to now? Uh, you see, you rightly mentioned about uh, China because uh, the... Uh, the bilateral ties, uh, the relationship between India and uh, Japan, uh, 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 if we see historically, uh, it has been always uh, very good, congenial, very friendly. And now there is a uh, 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 regional uh, compulsion, the, you know, the, the, the way the bilateral relationship, the, the ties have been you know, getting uh, strong and it is becoming more robust, is actually, in fact, in response to the changes which are occurring in the region. I would uh, like to uh, uh, specifically mention about uh, two or three uh, uh, main focus, main areas, main issues, which are actually bringing both India and Japan together. Number one, the uh, South China Sea, the, the Chinese uh, incursion and then the Chinese you know, militarization and uh, the uh, claim of uh, almost about 90% of the Sea in you know the, the South China Sea, uh, ignoring the claims of other other countries, uh, and also the the commercial uh, significance of uh, that region. This is one. Uh, uh, the objective is to how to actually secure this as a global common. Uh, this is one. The second thing is more recently the developments which are taking place in the Taiwan Straits. This is actually has emerged as a kind of new flashpoint. And uh, if we follow uh, very recently, the, the, the developments which are taking place uh, in the uh, Taiwan states following uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit, and subsequently the visits of many, many, you know, uh, French, German, Lithuanian, Japanese uh, lawmakers and politicians. These are all you know, uh, pointing to a kind of signal to Taiwan that uh, we are all, uh, uh, behind you, and uh, uh, the Chinese uh, continuous threat to annex, uh, uh, because, because as, as we all know, China has been claiming that Taiwan is, a, is, a, is one of its uh, renegade in province. So, so this, uh, the, I mean, even if it is a bilateral and you know, some kind of relationship between, some troubled relationship between Taiwan and uh, China, the larger uh, implication of this is impacting on the security, you know, regional security, the, the, the security of the region. And supposing tomorrow there is a, uh, a real conflict takes place between China and uh, Taiwan, it is inevitably many other countries also will be drawn in. So this is another concern 
uh, which uh, India and Japan have to you know, speak together. Certainly, that's and an the important aspect, Professor. Let, Professor. let me bring in, let me bring in uh, General Meston's perspective on that. General Meston, a shared security threat that both India and Japan today are facing. China's territorial expansion, China's military maneuvering is something that both of us have to tackle together. And this has been reiterated by External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar uh, today in his remarks as well uh, during the 2 plus 2 ministerial. Now, what we have seen also happening in Japan, perhaps because of this security threat, they are now recasting their national security strategies, something uh, which was quite unlikely and quite unexpected for a country like Japan to do so. But in the wake of this security threat, something that we have been facing in the Himalayas, Japan has been facing in its seas. And this has uh, certainly brought both the countries together. So in the wake of the defense cooperation and enhancing defense cooperation, how do you see this round of 2 plus 2 bringing these countries closer, especially when it comes to defense and strategic cooperation? Uh, Tida, good evening. A very pertinent issue raised by you. See, after all, a question which will be raised by everyone is, what has India and Japan to do uh, with defense cooperation and security concerns? Uh, I think uh, during the course of discussion, it has emerged very clearly that there is a security threat. Maritime concerns are foremost important to Japan and to India, especially in the Indo-Pacific region. We definitely want that the Indo-Pacific region should be a free, open, and rule-based Indo-Pacific region. There is no denial to that. And both Japan and India today also face a common enemy, that is China. China has been expansionist. It has been very assertive in the entire, uh, I would say, South, uh, 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 in the uh, South China Sea, East China Sea, uh, uh, with the Indians, uh, with our, uh, with our uh, nation, especially in the Himalayas, uh, right from Arunachal Pradesh to uh, Ladakh. So everywhere they have been assertive. Now, what is required is exactly on ground some things are happening. So there are two ways to handle a thing and both go, uh, both go complementary. One is diplomacy, dialogue, and the second is defense diplomacy. Now, defense diplomacy obviously leads to defense cooperation between nations and at times between trilateral nations and multilateralism. In the case of Japan and India, uh, we have been having bilateral, but at the same time, there have been certain aspects which have also emerged as trilateral and multilateral. For example, the uh, naval exercises between Indian Navy and the United States Navy started way back in 92. That time they were termed as Malabar exercises and it has been continuing since then. And 2007, Australia and Japan did enter and participate in the Malabar exercises, but it became formalized when in 2015, Japan joined Malabar exercise as a permanent uh, 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 joining, I would say, and thereafter Australia also joined in 20, uh, 2021. So what is happening is, now if you see all these people who have joined this Malabar exercises, they are also part of the Quad. Yes. So to some extent, the diplomacy and the military diplomacy is evolving in the Indo-Pacific region. Now coming on to uh, the naval, uh, naval aspects, first time just covering the naval, we also have the uh, JMX exercise, that is the Japanese Indo uh, bilateral maritime exercises. Now, they started uh, way back in 2012. They are bilateral and they are also continuing. And at the same time, with Coast Guard, we are having uh, search and rescue operations. Uh, Absolutely. Sometimes, so, uh, General, I'll, I'll, I'll continue of... the discussion with you and understand how these exercises enhance uh, you know, our cooperation, and especially in terms of enhancing the interoperability of our forces. But uh, Ambassador uh, Sharma has to leave. He has another commitment. So I, I'll just take another comment from him before we let him go. Ambassador, you know, uh, a lot of analysts have also expressed concern over the fact that even though India and Japan have had defense exchanges for nearly two decades, we have declared a common interest in keeping the Indo-Pacific free and open and most importantly rules-based. We are partners in the Quad. But if we look at the bilateral security cooperation, uh, it, it remains underdeveloped. What do you think are the challenges that are preventing strategic objectives from turning into outcomes? Given the fact that with uh, Japan, India has a blossoming relationship with has, which has only evolved over decades. Well, you know, Japan is now coming out of the old, as I said, and they are shedding their inhibitions. 
their defense budget itself is uh, poised to grow from 40 billion to almost double that amount. And in the next five years, so by 2030, Japan's defense expenditure will go up. And uh, they are also looking at, uh, you know, uh, the cutting edge technologies for defense. And this is the area where India is also very keen. And uh, like, you know, we had this proposal about the amphibian uh, ships, uh, uh, you know, between India and, and Japan, the, the whole uh, cooperation in that area. So in the maritime zone, uh, the cooperation between India and Japan, as the General Saab has actually mentioned, they, that, is, that is one area when they can really intensify and uh, get into more tangible uh, you know, bilateral deals. And uh, Japan is also keen to work now on long-range con conventional missiles. You know, and, uh, and they have uh, enormous uh, technological uh, capabilities. And uh, Japan's digital uh, prowess is also uh, well known. So these are the areas in the field in the in the field of cybersecurity, in the field of uh, you know 5G and and the digital uh, expansion. Uh, we should work together. I to me it appears these are very natural areas now for India and Japan to work. And our two countries have uh, have common concerns like uh, in energy security is uh, Japan's concern as well as India's concern. And we need to uh, pool our uh, efforts in this area so that uh, the, the, you know, under the uh, auspices of the Indo-Pacific Economic Cooperation Framework, Supply Chain Resilience, and, and the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative itself, we, we, we have uh, areas to, to really uh, move forward. So I would say that these, uh, the, these uh, are tangible and uh, uh, you know, action-oriented points on our agenda. And, the both, uh, and both countries can pick them up. The annual summits by our two prime ministers actually provide constant guidance and, and monitoring and also support to, to these, uh, these uh, processes. So when you see this, uh, we have a lot to do. And uh, this meeting has been very fruitful in that sense, Certainly. as is borne out by the statements. Absolutely. On the issues you. that you earlier said and the, uh, the way forward that's been discussed. So we'll continue the discussion with the other two guests. Ambassador, thank you for your time. It was a pleasure having you on this edition of The Perspective. Uh, Professor Panda, uh, coming to you to understand, you know, uh, these important aspects that Ambassador highlighted on how India-Japan relationship has evolved over the years. And this, uh, you know, brings me to a question on the role that uh, uh, late Shinzo Abe had to play. Uh, the, the relationship that India and Japan today enjoy is described as being an inclusive one, is, uh, you know, said to be a multi-layered partnership, which is only uh, evolving uh, with time. But the legacy that uh, Mr. Shinzo Abe leaves behind, how do you see that being built upon in the years to come? Uh, I'm very confident that um, uh, during the uh, you know, successive tenure of uh, you know, um, Prime Minister Suga and also now presently Fumio Kishida, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, relationship between the two countries will uh, become uh, more robust. And uh, if, we, if we see a little historically, if I can go back a little bit to the past, there has been no uh, uh, problem, no impediment in the uh, evolution of the bilateral relationships, except in 1998, when we uh, conducted the nuclear test, that was the only kind of you know temporary hiccup. But that was soon re uh, overcome uh, following uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, visit in August uh, 2000. And subsequently, there has been gradual and incremental uh, uh, deepening of uh, ties in almost all fronts: defense cooperation, um, cultural cooperation. Uh, economic cooperation in every dimensions of our relationship, I think we can uh, see robustness. And uh, 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 while uh, evaluating uh, the bilateral uh, relationship between our two countries, we also need to keep it in mind uh, what kind of constraints uh, Japan might be having internally uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, deepening or expanding. Uh, more uh, closer uh, defense cooperation because it has got some constitutional constraints. Now, the legacy which actually Abe, Shinjo, uh, has left behind us is uh, to understand is uh, he is the one uh, who, is the, who, was the, uh, who has been the architect uh, for initiating some um, you know, um, uh, changes internally within the uh, country. Uh, in particular, uh, how to amend the Article 9, the peace, peace constitution, 
because the Japanese constitution is, is, is uh, believed to be a kind of you know, a, a peace constitution. The specific clause, uh, it is not that easy, uh, but he did try. Uh, but uh, since the process of amending the constitution, by the way, till now, not even a single article of the Japanese constitution has been ever amended. If we see, if we compare that with our own constitution, we have you know, amended several times. Absolutely. But then there it's are certain you know, with the constitution. constraints. And uh, these constraints actually, uh, 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 Government Prime Minister Abe tried to address it. And since he could not do that, uh, at least halfway he came through. And uh, he, he uh, reinterpreted the constitution in such a way that the spirit of the peace clause was substantially diluted. And he made this collective... Uh, 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 Absolutely, Professor. So a lot seems to be changing in Japan. Currently, it is the ninth largest defense spender. And if it doubles its defense budget, it is going to become the third largest just behind US and China. And this could, of course, mean newer opportunities for India being an important partner. But coming back to the significance of defense cooperation uh, between India and Japan, uh, General Mestin, both India and Japan have sh have the shared desire to now further increase the scope and complexities of our bilateral exercise. Tell us and our viewers about the kind of military to military cooperation in terms of these exercises that we conduct and how do they enhance the interoperability of our forces, helping us, uh, you know, deal with any kind of security threat. Firstly, coming on to the defense cooperation, uh, let me also highlight that in the entire Indo-Pacific region, I think India is doing extremely well. We have got today defense cooperation and I myself was in the foreign division of the Indian Army for, as a colonel. So whether it be Philippines, whether it be, of course, Japan, uh, South, uh, sorry, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, we have been having extensive defense cooperation with all these countries. And therefore, what I'm trying to say is, that India is making solid footprints in the entire ASEAN uh, countries. We are really doing extremely well. And uh, therefore, now coming specifically to Japan. Now with Japan, uh, we have been having these exercises since many years. And the start point was 2008, uh, when there was a joint declaration to enhance uh, the security cooperation. And since then, I just uh, mentioned that the Malabar exercises were as it is continuing. Now, uh, thereafter, it was 2012, the J uh, JMX exercise, that is a joint, uh, that is a Japanese, India, maritime exercises have been conducted. And of course, now coming on to the army, uh, we have also been having the uh, Dharma Guardian exercises. Now, see, whenever a military exercises takes place between the Navy, the Air Force and the Army, everything starts with staff level talks. So, staff level talks means uh, we have, a, uh, for example, in the Army, we have a uh, department uh, which handles the foreign division and which is headed by a additional director general international cooperation so he generally heads the staff level talks with a team from some of the branches and they exchange talks and they establish some kind of a framework for defense uh, cooperation now once that is approved by the ministry of defense it takes off mm -hmm. now for example uh, coming on to the army now, in the Army, the Dharma Guardian exercises started uh, way back uh, uh, in uh, 2018. And this is supposed to be an annual feature. And it is supposed to be that the Japanese uh, one battalion would be coming to India. It is to be done in India because we have a large, uh, I would say, a diverse terrain uh, to handle all these aspects and logistics and all is also an important aspect. So we have got now certain training notes. For example, this year, in February, March, there was an exercise conducted for 12 days in Belgaum, uh, which has got a foreign training node. So one of the Indian Army battalions, 15 Maratha Light, was nominated, and we had the Japanese battalion, and they did a joint exercise. So this is how we have been progressing. Uh, and not only on this uh, exercise, uh, our bands have been going there. Uh, so many of these things happening, the chiefs of the Army staff visit, uh, their chiefs visit uh, the Japanese uh, Defense Forces, so a lot of uh, these visits and exchanges take place. But on ground, these are the major military drills. Navy, Navy I've already told you. Uh, Army, I've just mentioned to you. Now, coming on to the Air Force. Now, Air Force also, it has been established that there will be a joint fighter exercise, uh, I think, uh, probably maybe this year. Uh, and uh, this fighter exercise, again, the aspect is interoperability. 
So when, sir, uh, people operate, you know, uh, for example, now as an army man, I'll tell you, uh, this exercise which was conducted, so the troops from both the sides are participating. It is the endeavor of both the side troops that they start uh, understanding the local customs because, see, all these aspects are important for interoperability because Absolutely. if you have to operate together for some contingency, you have got to know each other. So knowing each other is by knowing each other, the culture, knowing certain names of the appointments, important appointments, uh, knowing the type of food we eat, and all these kind of things. And there is a commentary which is generated because... You're right, General. The, the and and state, I think all of they, these exercises and these exchanges uh, inject uh, significant military content into the already strategic partnership uh, that uh, both India and Japan continue to enjoy. So we hope that with this uh, round, the second round of uh, 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue between India and Japan, all of these aspects that our panelists have discussed on the wide range of issues, both regional and uh, global, of course, and mutual relationship between India and Japan is something that will go a notch higher. All of these uh, issues, particularly pertaining to the security threats, have been discussed in this critical meeting between uh, the defense minister uh, and his Japanese counterpart and also the external affairs minister, especially in the wake of the uh, pertinent challenges that India and the world continue to face and the need for India and Japan as important partners to ensure uh, a free, open, inclusive and most importantly a rules-based Indo-Pacific. So that is something towards which both countries are working towards. Uh, as uh, the general said, military drills are something that will help us, you know, uh, enhance our interoperability of our forces. At the same time, deal with any kind of security challenge in the wake of these uh, security threats that both India and Japan continue to face. So that having been said, I'll have to wind up the program. Thank you, General Meston and uh, Professor Panda for your time and for your important views on this edition of Perspective. Absolute pleasure to have both of you join us on the program today. So that's it from us uh, on this edition of Perspective. Thank you to you viewers as well for your time. I'll see you same time tomorrow now with another topic and a brand new set of panelists. Until then, you take care of yourselves and keep watching Sunset TV.